Welcome to another edition of RCE. This is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find a link to all of our Twitters and our blogs and the entire back catalog, which this is special. This is a very special episode. This is episode this is a 100. Special episode. This is not just another episode. Which episode is it, Brock? It is 100. It is episode 100. The very first episode. <laughs> Jeff is going to get a kick out of this because. Jeff was the first guest, and then I wrapped him into being on every show after that. Yeah, well, yeah George. George was on there, too. That is true. When, when was it? January 2009. We've been doing this over six years. 2009? Yeah, we've been doing it six years. How did we only hit 100 episodes since 2009? Doesn't it seem like there should be a lot more episodes? Yeah, someone should go mine the, scrape the site and mine the oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't ask people to do that. Because, <laughs> because they'll do it. Find- Our audience will do it. <laughs> Yes, right. someone in the audience will do it. They'll find it like, oh yes, there were there were times when it was wonderful, when it was every two weeks, and then there were droughts. Yeah, <laughs> that's a little embarrassing, but it happens sometimes. People, life just gets in the way. Yeah, yeah, it's all over the place. No, it's still pretty awesome. Yeah, every now and then you can see on my blog, failure as a service. I'll put up like our stats and like the culture that is RCE, and the fact that like. 10% of our clients come from other Unix system because everyone's rewriting their user agent because we're all tinfoil hat people and everything else in this industry. <laughs> we're terrible. <laughs> so, right, okay. Well, who do we have for 100 today? Okay, so our guest today is Eli Dart. Now, this is a follow up to our previous podcast, episode 99, which was Perf Sonar. Um, which was how to measure your network. Eli today is going to talk about the Faster Data Project. So, Eli, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Hey, how's it going? Uh, so, my name's Eli Dart. I'm a network engineer in the science engagement group for the Energy Sciences Network, or ESNet. Um, so, my job is to help science collaborations get the most out of the uh, mission science infrastructure that we build and deploy. Okay, so faster data, um, it's, it's, it's not software. It's, it, it involves software, but you're not actually writing software and stuff. So tell us what exactly is the faster data effort. So faster data is um, a network performance knowledge base, essentially. Um, it's a repository of, of a whole bunch of information that we have found to be helpful in, um, in really doing performance tuning or performance engineering or helping science collaborations really effectively use the uh, high performance infrastructure that, that exists for their use um, in the science complex. Okay, so no, wait a minute. Can you explain that a little bit? Because, I mean, don't I just need like my 10 or 100 gigabit uplink and I'm good to go? I mean, how much harder is it than that? Well, so think about this, right? You go and you buy this beautiful, shiny... Um, 4,000 core uh, uh, computing cluster and you go and you plug it all together and you slap on the default install and your users are good to go, right? Right. Not. So if you go and um, put together a high performance network and you go, alright, it pings, it's good. Walk away. It is unlikely that you're going to um, get the performance out of it um, that you would really like to or that you paid for. And so just like computing systems, um, networks have um, some configuration and some tuning um, and ideally some test and measurement involved in making them into high-performance, scientifically relevant tools. Okay, so Perf Sonar, you know, talked a bunch about, you know, we do a lot of continuous testing to see where the bottlenecks are and whatnot. But, but you're talking more about, well, at least... The, the, the first phase is when you install your shiny new cluster or your shiny new network switch or your shiny new uplink or things like that. What are typical types of issues that people run into that perhaps they didn't expect? So there are a variety of things, right? So, I mean, on, on the one hand, you could have bought the wrong gear um, and just you know, not, not have something that's going to perform when you throw the workload at it that you're going to throw at it. And so um, getting stuff, you know, getting I mean, the equipment itself that's capable in terms of the workload you're going you're gonna to run on it is important. And that's the, the, the analogy that HPC holds there as well, right? Um, you can also um, just not 
architect it right. I mean, there, there's an element of network architecture as well. Um, involved in making sure that the design of the thing is is well suited to the tasks you're going you're to put to it. So there's there's, there's a variety of, of things that you have to consider, um, just as you would with any kind of major infrastructure investment. So it seems like there's a lot of different pieces you would need to kind of completely validate. You know, we had Perf Sonar, which was a collection of tools that ESNet's involved with. But you had more. You had tuning, and so you had best practices. You had software to use that implemented things differently than the common solutions. What are all the different pieces that faster data actually kind of advocates for? So, so, so faster data is a knowledge base, and so the, the you know we we put things in there that that um, are sort of relevant to that set of tasks. Um, if you want to look at um, sort of what's the what's the right framework in which to consider high performance networking for data intensive science? Um, you're getting into something that we call the science DMZ model, uh, and uh, there's a big section of faster data devoted to the science DMZ model. But that's a, a set of design patterns for um, building and operating uh, network infrastructure for data intensive science, essentially. Um, so the, the, a lot of what would be um, things that you would consider in that, um, in, in, in building and deploying this, are covered by the science DMZ model. And then there are a whole bunch of aspects of faster data that include um, more detailed information about how do I, in particular, do I set this thing up or, or you know, how do I drive this particular tool. So there's a whole breadth of, of information. So let's go more into the science DMZ. Let's get, get to a specific detail. Um, yeah, I work at an HPC center at a large public university, and I have users with data, and they're logging in from all different parts of campus. And I have a big distributed network. How would a, a science DMZ look like at an institution like mine? Now, so, so there is no one true science DMZ, right? A science DMZ is a, it's a design pattern, not a legal specification. So um, there are a few key components um, of a science DMZ, um, and, and their specific instantiation depends very much on the environment that you're in, the budget you have, uh, and the workload that you, that you need to serve. So a science DMZ is a, is a enclave, at, typically at or near the site network perimeter, um, that's designed specifically for data intensive science. That's where you put all of the, the pieces that you're that are have the all the pieces that have the um, responsibility for getting data in and out of the site. So specific um, systems, which you call data transfer nodes, would go there. You definitely want Perfsonar in there. I mean, you you, you talk with Jason about Perfsonar. Perfsonar is one, it is is a key component of the science DMZ, and that's a place where Perfsonar really shines. Um, and so you you. That's that's the spot where you would integrate all those things. So what would that look like for a major public university? There are a lot of different ways to build it depending on the network culture, the funding environment, who needs what when. Um, are you just starting? Is this a mature deployment? There are a lot of different ways, um, uh, this, a lot of different flavors, a lot of different colors, a lot of different ways it can look. Now, the phrase DMZ is, is typically uh, associated with just hanging something out there with no protection on the Internet. Like if uh, you ask a typical Internet user, they look at their home router, they're like, oh, I can have one of my you know, home PCs hanging out on the DMZ, which basically means it's sitting in front of the firewall. Is that one of the precepts here? Yeah, so let's, let's take one step back and say, so what, what is a DMZ? Um, and, and actually, the notion for the for for the science DMZ, the DMZ part of that comes from traditional um, network security design. So, in a previous life, I, I'm network security engineer. Um, so, if you look at what a security DMZ is, a security DMZ is a portion of the network at or near the site perimeter that is designed and built specifically to to host external facing services, authoritative DNS. Um, incoming and outgoing um, mail, uh, world-facing web servers, things of that nature. And you put it out there uh, in front, um, right at the, at the site perimeter, 
um, because the, the traffic and the applications running in the DMZ have a different security profile um, and, and often um, a different application profile than um, whatever you've got running on your internal LAN. And so you build a specific enclave and you put those external facing services there. That does not mean that it's undefended, right? What that means is um, it is defended differently than the LAN. Um, is defended in a way that is appropriate for a DNZ, not necessarily in a way that's appropriate for a LAN, because it's different. Right? And so, so in the DMZ, you apply security policy and policy enforcement mechanisms that are specifically tailored to the services running in that DMZ. So in a science DMZ, that basic design methodology is the same. Right? It's an area at or near the site perimeter designed specifically for high performance data intensive science services that involve collaborating with other institutions. And so it's designed and built specifically um, to serve those, those needs and those applications and those workloads. Okay, so when you set one of these things up, does, does this, would this involve like all the software defined network to make like frictionless paths and stuff and does that actually accomplish what you want here or is that kind of hype for a different part of the industry? Uh, SDN definitely has a place in the science DMZ. Um, we should give a shout out here to some of the um, uh, science DMZs that have been funded by recent um, programs from the NSF. So the CCNIE, um, CCIIE, and CCDNI programs have funded a bunch of science DMZs at, at major universities around the country. Um, I should say that a whole bunch of those science DMZ deployments specifically incorporated SDN. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of SDN ready or running SDN now science DMZs. So there's a lot of hype around SDN but there are people who are doing real work with it at the same time. And I'll say, the people who have their hands on it now, people who have um, a way in which they can get their operational feet wet with it and actually roll around with it and understand it and see what it does, they're going to be ahead as, as SDN um, goes more mainstream. And the Science DMZ is a really useful place to deploy SDN in your network whether the entire science DMZ is SDN enabled or whether um, you have an SDN enclave that's attached to the science DMZ just as you might have a um, biology enclave or a high energy physics enclave or a climate enclave attached to your science DMZ. Um, it's, it's a really good way to get your hands on it and get some work done with it um, and use that as a platform for rolling it out to the rest of the infrastructure. All right, let's let's shift track a little bit here. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that that uh, you advocate in terms of tuning and things like that. Why? Let, let me just take a step back in the beginning here and ask. And and I'm somewhat uh, tongue in cheek here because I, I work for a networking company, obviously. But why do we still need to tune TCP and network settings on servers after you know so many years of uh, scientific data and all the data rates keep going up and all the Ethernet vendors are pushing 10 and 40 gig NICs these days and so on. So why don't operating systems just do the right thing now? The primary reason, um, in, in my view, is that um, high performance, um, sort of air quotes, big data science is not actually the common use case. And the defaults are designed for the common use case, as they should be. And if you, if you live your life in the place that's outside the common use case, then you know, you're going to have to customize some aspects of your life. There's sort of no way around that, right? Um, and so there have been a lot of advances in auto-tuning over the past um, 10 or 15 years. In particular, RFC 1323, which gives us window scaling, um, and kernel auto-tuning. Those are both huge, huge, huge wins. But you still need to make sure that the configuration on your host gives those mechanisms enough rope um, to actually do their work for you. And so um, some of the defaults are getting better, um, but we still need to make sure that, that when stuff gets deployed, um, 
you go through and you configure it properly and you test it to make sure that it's working correctly, just as you would for any other you know item of major cyber infrastructure. Okay, so what are the most common things you found when you were testing this out that kind of affects performance when you're talking about TCP settings and stuff? What are those settings? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. So um, making sure that um, your auto-tuning buffers are high enough, um, making sure that um, you have um, both the uh, um, backlog um, counter turn or the backlog config turned up and also your um, transmit queue depth. I mean, it, it, essentially, just th things to allow um, to allow everything to, to work cleanly, right? I mean, um, if you, anytime you, you get into a place where you have to s sit and wait for somebody else to do something, right, that's idle time that you're not using um, your infrastructure to the full. And so, um, in the, in the TCP windowing case, that's if you're if you're talking to something a long distance away, that allows you to have enough data in flight that you can make full use of your pipe. Um, for transmit queue, that means you can actually um, put enough stuff on the wire. Um, for uh, receive queue, that means that your host doesn't get overrun and cause packet loss. So there, there are a few basic um, settings that can really get you a long way. Now, that's just the network side, though. That doesn't deal with storage, um, and that's just the host portion that doesn't deal with the core network at all. So two things. You said faster data is a knowledge base, so you kind of have notes and best practices for Linux kernel settings and stuff all on the faster data website for things we were just talking about. Yes. Uh, and in fact, they're designed for easy cut and paste, um, including the comments. Okay. So... But isn't the rest of, like, commodity internet kind of moving this direction? We're doing more video delivery. I mean, it seems like a Netflix stream to my house is about 30 megabits per second. That's faster than I see most SCP transfers to and from our system actually travel at. How are they reliably delivering that data when I can't do it using SCP today? Well, so there's reliable and there's fast, and those are two separate things. Um, reliable means... Um, I did it correctly, right? I got all the bytes from one side to the other. Um, I did it in order without changing any of them. Um, and I do that every time you ask me to do it. That's very different from, um, I did it really, really fast. And so you're happy with how well I performed when I did it. Um, I should say that SCP is a pretty poor data transfer tool. Um, it has some built-in limitations that, that cause some fairly significant performance problems. Um, so, at, and I realize people use SCP a lot um, for data transfer, and the main reason for that is that SSH is, is, the, is what's used for system access, right? And SCP is a data transfer mechanism that uses the same credentials that you get for free, and so that's why a lot of people use it. Uh, that doesn't make it an excellent data transfer tool. Okay, yeah, I guess by reliable, I was thinking they reliably deliver 35 megabits a second to my Blu-ray player that plays to Netflix. <laughs> so, it, you know, it can keep that stream going, which is interesting. So while we're on the SCP thing, you know, you have down here, you have an entire page on data transfer tools where you... You know, you have SCP and you have some data with these different tools. You have Globus, which we've had on the show before. You have BBCP. A lot of the common alternative data transfer tools on there. But you have this patched version of SCP. What, what's so important about that patched version that you get such different performance numbers? And what are those differences in performance numbers? Well, so um, I can't take credit for the patch. That was done by Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. Um, the stock SSH, SCP, and Friends application suite has some statically defined internal flow control buffers, uh, and they don't resize um, depending on um, what the what the latency is between uh, the sender and the receiver. And so that's the same as having static um, uh, TCP windows, which you know we fixed that a long time ago. Um, CRFC 1323 Windows scaling, right? 
um, and kernel auto tuning. So what that means then is that if you're using S, uh, an SCP to, to transfer your traffic, or if you're using SCP to transfer your data, um, you the application has some static buffering that is essentially defeating all of the auto tuning that your kernel has turned on for you. And so there you are, you're kind of stuck. What the patch from Pittsburgh does is allow that window um, uh, to scale at runtime. And so um, the, the, that allows SCP or rsync over SSH or what have you um, to scale its, um, its buffering along with all the other stuff that needs to scale um, with a long distance data transfer. Now, is this something that you need to be running your modified SCP on both sides? Or do you even get some benefit if you're only running the modified SCP on one side? How, how does that work? My understanding is you get some benefit um, if, there's, if it's only present on one side. But you really get more benefit um, if it's present on both. Okay. Um, now, is this something that, that could be submitted back upstream? Or, or have the uh, OpenSSH people indicated they don't want it because we're outside the mainstream? Um. So my understanding, and, and the, the person who can speak to this authoritatively is Chris Rapier at Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. Um, my understanding is that those patches have been um, submitted back to the OpenSSH folks, and the OpenSSH folks are not interested in incorporating them. Um, some other distributions um, have incorporated versions of those fixes into their into their standard version of SSH that they distribute with their system. I know FreeBSD um, has the, the semantically equivalent set of fixes built into the SSH that's installed by default on a FreeBSD host. Um, I'm not as sure if any of the Linux distributions do that, um, but that's, that's another way to do it, right, which is to say if you're maintaining your own patch set or your own distribution, you can just incorporate um, that set of fixes into the stuff that you run and that you deploy. Um, but I think that that it had it it's been offered to the open SSH people and I do not believe the open SSH people are going to incorporate the patches at this time. But again, you should really ask Chris Rapier about it for an authoritative answer. Okay, so you made some interesting comments there about you know why you need to tune for internet level distances, particularly when you're going through many hops um, to get to a peer, but does the same kind of philosophy apply when your peer is right next to you in the data center, maybe even one or just two hops away? So let's see, um, hop count actually, I mean, as a quick aside, hop count doesn't really matter with modern ASIC based routers and switches anymore. Um, so, but, but, but distance does, um, and if, if the further you have to go, um, the more um, the more TCP really has to work in order to maintain performance. So if you're just going to the next rack over, I mean, provided routing not pathological and it's sending you out to you know the East Coast and back um, from my California perspective, um, in order to get to the guy in the next rack. And I've seen that behavior, by the way, and it's really irritating. Um, but if all you need to do is go a few tenths of a millisecond over, TCP doesn't have to work very hard. And um, your you can be a lot more lenient with your tuning requirements. Uh, and so, and, and by the way, I should say that, that packet loss is going to affect you a lot less too because the control loop is so short because the latency is so low. So inside the data center, things are much, 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 much easier. And you have a lot more leeway in terms of what you can do, what kind of equipment you can use, and, and how you can run your machines. Okay, so besides the patch version of SCP, you had a whole list of other tools. And so besides vanilla SCP, what should, what would be your recommended tools for people to kind of look at for actually transferring? I guess there's two different sets of data. There can be, big data can mean millions and millions of little files, which, you know, we are, are bad for file systems and everything else, as well as, you know, large, large individual files. So what would be the tools you would think people should look at? So, um... As, as, you, as you hinted, right, um, different applications require different sorts of optimizations. 
Um, I've been doing some testing recently that shows that, you know, as is not surprising at all, um, large numbers of metadata operations, right, file and director creation, that sort of thing, is a real torture test, especially for large parallel file systems. Um, and some data transfer tools don't necessarily um, like those as much either. And so if you have bazillions and bazillions and bazillions of tiny files, I and mean, we, we see this sometimes in um, gene sequencing applications, right, where there'll be just ridiculous quantities of bitty, bitty little files. You might even want to um, roll those up into larger tarballs or something like that before moving them, um, depending on how your data transfer application is going to deal with it. Uh, if your data transfer application is appropriately pipelined and streamlined, maybe it's fine. Um, but for specific applications, um, we see a lot of people deploy Globus, and I, I, I think you said earlier that you've um, that you've had the Globus folks on here um, before, and so um, we certainly see a lot of Globus in uh, in science environments. Uh, there are other environments that use um, that use Aspera a fair amount. And so, you know, those those are two tools that I think are are a little more a little more polished um, and sort of designed to really be used by non-experts. There's a whole other suite of tools that um, if if you have an expert that's deploying it for some specific um, application between a small number of hosts, they can use whatever tool that they that they want. But if you're going to put something in the hands of somebody who's not an expert, you really want something that's going to actually just work when they when they use it. Um, and so, you know, Globus and Aspera are a couple of tools that do that do better for that kind of use case. I think you'll find Globus deployed at most of the major supercomputing facilities in the United States. All right, so you've talked about some some common user level tools that are good for this kind of stuff. What about standards? Are there any standards being worked on to make this better, even if it is still kind of a niche thing? I mean, the niche is still a pretty big niche that covers many people, even if it's not 7 billion people on the planet. It's It's got to be at least many thousands or tens of thousands of people that are affected. And so, you know, is there any technology uh, in a cross-cutting kind of sense that is being developed to make this better? Well, let's see. So... Um, for standards, I, I seem to remember that there is a um, standard for the protocols used in Grid FTP, which is what Globus uses under the covers, right, for, for actual um, data transfer engine. And I think there are multiple impl implementations of that that can interoperate. And so there, there is some standardization um, in that space. Um, Aspera's um, secret sauce is just that. It's secret, so it's proprietary, so that's not standardized. Um, there's a, I mean, the science DMZ is, um, is considered in, in many circles to be best practice now. Um, that's not a standard either. That's just a, a, a sort of agreed upon, um, best practice. So, um, I mean, there, there are some standards efforts out there. I think NIST may be working on a, you know, they have some big data initiative or something like that, but it's not clear to me that they're doing tools work. Specifically, so unfortunately, um, I'm afraid I have to say that you know there there are some widely deployed things and there are some some best practices out there, but I wouldn't say that that we've gotten to the point where there are proper standards um, for dealing with this, at least in the way that that some of us might like to see them. And and I guess I should say right in the absence of standards, things like knowledge bases are really important, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, we put together and maintain faster data. So one of these tricks you see on a, a lot of these systems, or one of the tuning parameters, at least on systems like Globus, is you know parallel TCP streams or sending multiple files simultaneously, each in their own TCP stream. Why does that work so effectively, and should just more people implement that? So there are a couple of reasons why that that works well. So if you if you have a uh, an environment, right? So you have two hosts, and you're you're transferring data from you know host A to host Z, and there's some network path between them, and so your 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 data transfer application is is going between those two hosts over that network path. Um, 
there's going to be some. <laughs> my uh, my colleague Eric has this has this rule of performance, as he puts it. There's always something keeping the system from going faster, right? And so, if the thing that's keeping that data transfer from going faster is single stream TCP performance, then if you add another stream, um, you can get more performance by by doing that because you'll have a second thing that's running over the same path. Neither one of them are taking the full path. And so you can add performance in that way. Now that only works up to a certain point because at some point you're either going to fill the network pipe or you're going to end up with too much host contention or, or you're going to max out your storage or something. But parallelizing um, by, by TCP connection does get you performance increase if per flow TCP performance is your bottleneck. Okay, so all this being said and done, um, and again, I work for a networking company. When I when I joined Cisco, I, I I thought I understood TCP, and over the years, I have come to understand that holy cow, TCP is incredibly complicated, subtle, and is really pretty good at at what it does. And the people who have written the network OS stacks for TCP and whatnot are fantastically smart people, much much smarter than me. But there are still these, these limitations that we run into. Uh, you know, is it better to not use TCP, to use something like UDP uh, and, and do your own retransmission? I mean, do you have experiences with applications that try to do that instead of TCP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that, that's another way of, of going about this, right? Is if, 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 you, if for some reason you can't make TCP work, well, then you use something that's, that's not TCP. Um, there's an open source version of this called UDT um, that some folks use. I think you can even plug that into, into Grid FTP if you want to. Um, and that, matter of fact, I know that you can. You can plug that directly. There's a Grid FTP module that you can just plug that in. Um, I think Aspera is, is non-TCP, so that's, that's another reason why people might use Aspera is if they can't make a TCP-based data transfer tool work. Um, the thing is, though, um, TCP is is the standard um, uh, data transfer tool, or not data transfer tool, my apologies. TCP is um, the standard reliable byte stream service in the TCP IP protocol stack. And so um, the vast, vast majority of deployed applications that need reliable in-order byte stream delivery use TCP. And so there's this gigantic, gigantic deployed base. If you if you only have a small number of of machines or hosts or sites or whatever that you need to that you need to deal with, it may be that deploying something non-standard is tractable. If you have to have your data service be used by a wide variety of organizations, each with their own missions, funding models, staffing, um, support models, everything else, um, that starts to argue very strongly in favor of a um, of a standard solution. So, um, I mean, yes, you can you can do fine not using TCP. Um, there aren't that many applications that do it, and and they tend to be niche applications. So we're starting to see some things like I think Google put forward a new proposal for a new reliable service to kind of be the next generation of TCP. Do we see any of that coming out of our community? You mentioned UDT, but I believe that's kind of still a play on UDP. Do you see anything starting to maybe gain traction and become like a try this first, then fall back to TCP kind of emerging anywhere or not? I don't see anything in the sort of new transport protocol space. Um, uh, coming out of the out of the research community at the moment, um, most of the it, it seems to me at least that mo most of what the research community is focused on is um, higher. You know, sort of it's it's a one step up the stack from that. Right? It's how do I get the data there? You you know, using the substrate that I've got, how do we get the data there? Um, and that's that's where faster data and the science DMZ and all these tools come in. And then how do I work with that data using computing um, in order to um, extract the science and, and extract the knowledge from, from that data. That's where most of the focus is at the moment. Um, 
Google's going to come out with a brand new transport protocol. Um, we'd love to look at it. I think that'd be cool. Um, adoption is going to be tricky. Um, but that's the case with anything new. And if it's better, people will adopt it. You know, we'll have to see. So uh, a little bit of a get a more of an opinion piece from you. You're working on things like faster data, in which you're you know you're using tools like Persona to verify that your network performs the way that you know it was advertised to, and you know you're doing all these tunings and stuff. When in most cases, what is your gut feeling for scientific data? Is it these settings and tools we're using that are holding us back more, or is it a lack of investment in the physical infrastructure? Hmm. So I would I would say it's it's a variety of things, um, but you hit most of them, and that and that's that's why that's why we have the science DMT model, right? Is is um, that's an integrated way of looking at um, the current best practices of how to do these things properly. And so it addresses the, the common sources of, of performance problems, right? which is um, networks that are not um, designed properly, and so they cause packet loss, or it's hard to fix the packet loss when you find it, or there's packet loss present and you can't find it, and so you need a tool like Sonar. Uh, or you have uh, data transfer servers that are also, you know, doing other things. They're not dedicated. They're not um, specifically configured for data transfer. Um, maybe you're not using the right tools. You're doing everything with stock SCP um, or you know WGET or something like that. Uh, so that's the that's the common set of problems. Um, and the Science DMZ model provides an integrated set of best practices for for dealing with that set of problems. And that's why that's why that's a big part of, of faster data. But then you, you know, it could be you you go and you deploy your science DMZ and this doesn't work right. Okay, now I need to dig into particular specific details of particular aspects of this. And that's why you need the other half of the knowledge base, um, which gets into the details of how individual things are set up and configured and troubleshooting techniques and so forth. So what is the, the typical path for someone, uh, let's say I'm a network administrator and it's been brought to my attention that my researchers are getting crappy network performance and so on. Uh, what, do they, what do they do? Do they come to your website and start digging for you know, just question and answer kinds of things? Or what, what's the typical route? What's available? Well, I mean, people do different things depending on their, on their expertise and what they think the problem is. Um, I mean, as a network engineer myself, I can, I can tell you what I do when, when someone comes to me with a problem. I mean, the first thing I do is say, okay, well, um, what are you trying to do and how are you trying to do it? <laughs> because, because without having that baseline as context, um, it's really hard to understand um, what, what's possible, what good means, right? Because good or fast or enough is very different for different groups of people and, and under different circumstances. So try to characterize what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it. See if it's even possible to do what they're trying to do in the method that they're that they're using to try to do it. Um, and then see where to go from there. If what they're doing makes sense based on what they're trying to do and um, it's not working for them, then you can get in and troubleshoot that specific set of things. But uh, you know, I run into a lot of cases where where somebody you know they they want to do X, and instead of using stuff that's well suited to doing X, they're using Q, and it's like, well, okay, um, I realize that you know you thought you needed Q, but maybe let's try X over here and see if that will work better for you. And in some cases, it's just swap the tool, and and they're happy. They go away. They're they're cruising. Um, in other cases, it's a big, huge involvement problem that they're having is actually two providers down and they have no visibility into what those guys are doing. So for you specifically, um, sitting there working at ESNet and someone comes in with a problem, what's kind of been your proudest moment in terms of, you know, this faster data effort helping out a researcher? 
I don't have one single proudest moment, I don't think. Um, different ones are rewarding in different ways. Uh, there was one case where, uh, this goes straight back to SCP, right? Um, somebody was, they were, it was an international, large scale international data transfer. Um, and just by saying, hey, why don't you guys try and use this, the, the patched version of SCP, um, we shaved literally months off of their data transfer time, which had a huge impact on the productivity of the project. So, you know, that felt pretty good. Um, in other circumstances, it's just being, being able to have the information available to people so that they can help themselves. Um, that's a gigantic, a gigantic, gigantic win. Um, so that, so that people don't have to stumble around in the dark, right? There's a place where they can go, um, and get the information that they need, apply it to their setup, to their circumstance, to their workflow and get on with their lives without having to go and beg an expert to, you know, deign to look at their, at their particular issue. Um, so we, we want to do two things, right? We want to make sure that people can get help themselves as much as they can, um, and then give the experts a tool to use to help folks with that they run out of steam, and then at the same time preserve the experts' time for the really hard problems. So what's coming in the future, right? You have a lot of information there on your website. You even mentioned that it's easily copy and pasteable and things like that. How do you uh, keep this relevant? Is it, is it just injection of new best practices over time as technology changes? Or do you have major new features coming that people can look forward to? Or, you know, what, what's the future of faster data, basically? Well, so the future of faster data is um, better organization. So the, as the site grows, we have to refactor it every every so often, just because we stop being able to find stuff. If we can't find stuff, you can't either. Um, so it's gotten it's gotten big, um, and and that's good because there's a lot of stuff there. So we're going to need to you know every once in a while we shuffle things around. In terms of this space. Um, the thing that I would really like to see is um, further adoption of the science DMZ model um, and therefore less need for um, some of the things that we have on faster data. Um, if, we, if we can get to the place where um, to first order infrastructure is built correctly and people are using the right tools, um, there will be a lot less need for um, very detailed uh, network performance tuning. So, I mean, it, it's it's kind of ironic, right? I mean, but I, ideally, we, we would like to see people need this less, right? Because everything was working correctly um, and and scientists could get their work done without having to stop and, and ask questions of, of their system administrators. So how did the faster data effort get started? Faster data came from um, Brian Tierney's TCP tuning site. So Brian Tierney had been maintaining um, a set of um, TCP tuning parameters and how-tos and best practices for well over a decade um, at Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, and when Brian came to work for ESNet, he brought all that information with him. Um, and we... Um, stood that up as a knowledge base um, uh, within ESNet for use by, by our constituents. And I started working on it at that point as well. Um, and when the Science DMZ model um, came about, we incorporated the, the Science DMZ content in the, into the faster data site as well. Um, and it's really grown over time um, just to, to include everything that we find useful in in working with scientists to make their infrastructure go faster, but it, it, this historically this this came this came from Brian Tierney's efforts in in maintaining um, TCP tuning information for the community. Great, Eli, thank you very much for your time. Where can people find the faster data um, knowledge base, and if they want to get a hold of you, how do they do that? So uh, it's a couple different things there. So faster data is it's just fasterdata.es. It's a, it's a website that ESNet maintains. Um, there is also a, a science site there. Uh, there's also an announcement uh, list that we use for um, for 
training events or, or things like that. I think it's just faster data events, and there should be a, a, a link on the site for that as well. Um, for getting a hold of me, one of the best ways to do that is actually on the Science DMZ list. Um, but, uh, but you can look me up on, on uh, ESNet as well. Um, I'm just dart at ES.net, so you can get a hold of me that way if you need to. Um, so yeah, that, I, I, guess, I guess that's it really. It's, it's, it's just there on, on the net, so fasterdata.es.net. Hey, Eli, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Thanks Eli. And uh, glad to be on episode 100, so 100 for 100 gig, we're good. Woohoo! <laughs>